just doing it the same old way, the same old thing, time after time again. And that's why I switch seats. Yeah, that's right. It's good to, mm -hmm. sometimes to put ourselves in a different perspective. Yeah. Look at things from another angle, from another side, and yeah. and uh, see what that says to us or does to us. As long as we're not just running away and trying to escape from one place to get to another place. Well, as we uh, continue to look at Paul's words to the Philippians, and looking in the third chapter, and this morning now uh, looking at verses 4 through verse 16. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks as he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think, in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let you hold true to what we have obtained. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning as we look at this, I want to take those statements at the end of this, Paul's conclusion in verses 15 and 16, and then go back and look at what Paul is referring to. In those two verses, he says, those who are mature, Okay? That doesn't mean those who have been a Christian for a long time. It could mean that, but not necessarily. It doesn't mean those who are older versus younger. But those who have matured in Christ will think this way. If not, God will reveal it to you. So hold on to what we have obtained through Christ. In the last two Sundays as we've been looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians in chapters 1 and 2, we've seen several times him use this word thinking. And we've talked about that what Paul means by think is not just using intellectual capacity, not just reasoning out things, but adopting a life attitude. 
that it is about having a lifestyle that is in Christ. That we are to take on the mind of Christ, to think the way Christ thought, meaning to do what Christ did. What did Jesus do? Well, those are the things that we should do. How did Jesus conduct himself, his attitudes, the ways that he evolved around people, the way that he interacted with people, those are the ways that we should interact with people. In his love, in his grace, in his mercy, in his compassion, in his healing, those are the ways that we should be. That is, Jesus said that I do nothing except that which the Father tells me to do. Not of my own thinking, my own planning, my own conniving, but what God the Father has told me to do, that is what I do, that is what I say, that is what I think about. A life that is totally focused upon God. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the fourth chapter, he talks about the function of the church. And in that, he says that the purpose, the, the direction, the function of the church is to guide and to equip people to unity of faith. To guide people into a knowledge of Christ Jesus for maturity. To help people to grow up into the fullness of Christ so that we won't be confused or deceived by the false teaching, the schemes of the world so that we don't flitter back and forth, tossed about like the wind, Not sure of what it is that God would have us to do or how God would have us to live. Or on Sunday, being a really good Christian, but then on Monday, well, just kind of being a kind of good Christian. That we would be solid all the time. Firm, strong, standing in the faith in Jesus Christ at all times and in all places. And as Paul begins this passage, and he's, he's, he's writing to, to the Philippians, it's become aware that in this letter, Paul is under attack. That Paul is having to wrestle with people who are what we might term as Judaizers. Strong, upward, Jewish Christians who have come into these group of Gentiles and telling them how they ought to live. We all face this same problem in the church at Galatia. And these Judaizers are saying, we're the outstanding people. This is the way that you need to be. You need to make sure that you don't eat shrimp or catfish. That you don't do this or that. All the rules and the regulations that were in the Old Testament that were a part of being Jews. That make sure that you take a microscope and examine all your clothing. And that if you have a clothing that's made out of cotton, that it only has cotton thread. In it. it doesn't have wool thread or synthetic thread. That if you put on your shoes and they're leather, then you make sure that you wipe your hand on a wool cloth before you touch anything else. That you don't walk more than six-tenths of a mile on Sunday, on the Sabbath day. That you don't break a sweat on the Sabbath day. You don't pick up anything that would be heavier than would cause you to go, mm. No housework, no nothing, no work of any kind. You know, all of these things that you should do that in Judaism was a part of that. And they were saying, well, we're the outstanding Jewish Christians and we're going to tell you how to live. And so Paul, as he's dressing them, 
says, you think that you're great Jews. You think that you're great Christians. Now, um, I've mentioned this before that uh, we see this in the passage that we read in Matthew, that they knew that the Pharisees knew that they were talking about, Jesus was talking about them. And um, one time in, in interacting with a Jewish rabbi, and I was, we were talking about the Church of the Nazarene, and, and he was like, well, you know, I, I know about this group, of this church or that church. What are the, the, um, the Nazarenes like? And I said, well, they're the modern-day Pharisees. He goes, ah, I know exactly who you are. You think that you dot all the I's and cross all the T's. We don't do this, and we don't do this, and we don't do that. And we don't go with people who do those things. We make sure that we go to church three times a week. Sunday morning, I even heard a GS a couple years ago. He says, I believe that it's a command in the Bible that we have church on Sunday night because Jesus met in the upper room with the disciples on the eve of his resurrection. Therefore, we ought to have, we can't, must have Sunday night service. And I thought, that was Saturday night. Wasn't Sunday night. And that was not stated as a command. You know, they're all we create all these things. And we have to dress a certain way. You know, women can't wear pants. Any women in here wearing pants this morning? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Anybody got makeup on? Any women got makeup, got lipstick on? Got, is it red? As long as it, oh, gotta watch out for those people. I, I remember somebody in the church was telling me about several years ago that someone told them that in the church that you don't give children straws because if they use a straw, that's sinning. I'm like, you got a kid, where in the world is that? Like, well, you're making it easy for people. You know, they got it's like, I don't know. You know, we create all these things and think, oh, we're good, righteous, holy Christians because we do all of these things. As Rhonda said in Sunday school, we become safe, sanctified, and petrified in our righteousness, our righteousness. Because I do all of these things. I got saved this way. I got sanctified this way. And I'm going to get died this way. You're already dead, I hate to tell you. And that's what Paul is confronting. He says, so if you think that you have all of that credentials. I remember when we first came into the Church of the Nazarene. I, I, it took me a while to decide that I was going to join in the Church of the Nazarene because all these people were talking about, well, I'm a second generation Nazarene. Well, I'm a third generation Nazarene. One fourth generation Nazarene. And I said, Why? Well, give a rip about how many generations you are. I want to know where, where you are in Christ. Your birth pedigree has nothing to do. Now, and that's what Paul is dealing with. So Paul says, You think you're all that hot stuff? Well, let me tell you hot stuff. Here's who I am. And he lists all this description. Paul's got a resume that puts them all to shame. And I can understand that. Because I, I remember when I came into to pastoral ministry and, and I, I was told, well, you know, give us your resume. And I, so I, well, being in the professional world, I gave them my resume just like I would if I were applying for a college professorship. And my resume is about eight pages long. And they were like, oh, oh don't do that. You'll scare them all off. Well, that's what Paul was saying. He was saying, I am <coughs> all of these things, but I counted all as loss. In fact, he even makes it so strong. He says that not only is all this nothing, not only is all this meaningless, in most of your translations it may say rubbish, but that is a nice word for what Paul actually said. Paul said, 
that it's all stinking, decaying crap. It's, as we go back in the King James, which is probably a closer translation to what the word is, it's dumb. It's ship it high in transit stuff. That's what all that's worth. John Wesley, as he was looking at it, said, it is what is cast away in abhorrence. It is the vilest of refuse. It is excrement. It is the most worthless scrap. It is that which is not even fit for the dogs. All of that. All of those accomplishments and things that society lifts up and says are so important. For God are worthless. <coughs> uh, I was thinking about the things that I have and, and looking around, and I've got you know, a number of degrees, and I've got these different things, and, I, and my shelves are full with the little keepsakes and all that. And I thought, what are, of, of all my shelves, what are the th three things that I would treasure the most? The three things that I treasure the most one is a soccer ball. That is signed by the, all the kids on the first team that I coached. They were the dregs of the league. No other coach wanted them, so they gave them to me. And we won a championship. And all those players signed a ball and gave it to me at the end of the year. What they did, it's a memory of. My investing myself in them and they became something. That matters. The other one is a picture of a group of people that were in the Midland Community Church of the Nazarene. I was the NWMS president. I was what would now be the NMI president. I was the missions president. And that church had never gone on a work and witness trip. We decided to do a work and witness trip when we went to Costa Rica. And it was on that witness trip that the Lord called me into ministry. And I've got a picture that has that group. And, and another little fish that was made by our pastor from wood that we got down in Costa Rica. That, that's another treasure of having been with that group of people on their first ever mission trip. One guy who was scared to EBGBs to get on an airplane. Got on that plane and he has now flown all over the place in different parts of the world going on more mission trips. Another couple that had never been on anything like that and he, was, he then later became the missions president. I look at, got a couple. And another one, is a little frame that I've got that's got a white tie in it. And the tie is signed by a bunch of children. From my years as a children's pastor in Kent Church of the Nazarene, I look at where those kids are, the things that they're doing now, the lives that God has impacted. Those are the treasures. Not my certificates, my diplomas, but the things that are about the people that have been impacted in their lives. Their lives have changed. And those are what really matters. And Jim Elliott, who was, as a college student, wrote in his journal <coughs> a line that became the, the line that characterized his life and he became a missionary in Ecuador. And while as a missionary, and they were trying to reach a tribe of uh, the Aka Indians who had never been reached for Christ. And they were dropping off things to them and finally they landed their plane, he and three others. And they were executed by the people. His wife and one of the other wives then decided to move into that place and packed up their children and moved to the tribe 
that was known for being headhunters. And that tribe became Christians, and they're now some of the leading pastors of Ecuador. But Jim wrote in his college diary, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Paul says for us to hold on to Christ. Hold on to Christ. That we can keep. All those other things come and go. They're immaterial. They're like dung. They go in the rubbish heap and pass away. All that matters is a life of faith in Christ. My righteousness, my achievements are not what is important, but it is the righteousness that comes from God. <clears throat> Through faith in Him. That word righteousness from God is in the Old Testament a word of relationship, about a covenant relationship of what God has agreed to do with those who will be his people, that he will be faithful and love them, that he will give his saving grace and deliver them from their sins and from the consequence of those sins, eternal death. That he will enable them to be right with him so that they can live right in the world. And then our response to that is to allow his grace <coughs> to be born out through us. To live a life of faith, of obedience, to take on his life in and through us, that others might see that our attitudes and our actions are not our own, but the attitudes and the actions of God himself. This faith, this living in the presence of God and demonstrating his power for life in all circumstances, even if that means suffering, just as Jesus suffered, knowing that the sufferings in this world are only temporary. That nothing really matters but a life that is totally given over to God. Because with Christ, we have an eternal life. A life with Christ forever if we are living in Christ now. If we are living the mature life in Christ, so therefore we press on, we press upward with the upward call that is in Christ Jesus for us in our lives. Paul admits that he has not yet arrived at that, that he is still working at it. None of us have arrived. I have not arrived. But it is our challenge, by the grace of God, that we can live in him every day to follow him. The image that Paul uses is that of a runner. And I remember as I was coaching track, and one of the things that we had to get across to these kids you may be winning the race, but don't look back. Because as soon as you look back, you take time off. You slow down. It's not really about winning, but it's about doing your best. And your best cannot be distracted by what's behind you. Either the accomplishments, look how many people I've passed, or how far I've come, or even my failures. Oh, I hit that last hurdle. I wonder if it fell over. Doesn't matter. 
It's over with. I'm going on. If I think about the past, if I dwell in the past, then I'm going to stumble, trip, slow down. I've got to keep my eyes on the finish. And the finish is Jesus Christ himself. He is the author, the finisher of the race. And so we run in his footsteps, following him. That's mature living in Christ. Remembering and living the presence of Christ in our lives. Holding on to who Christ is and what Christ has done for us, what Christ is doing in us, and what Christ will do for us if we continue in him. Is that how we describe our life? A life of maturity? Don't look around and say, well, I'm more mature than that person. Or, oof, well, I'm not quite as mature as that person. It doesn't matter. Sometimes we have to do like the horses, and we put blinders on them. Don't look off to the side. Don't look at what somebody else is doing or not doing. Look straight ahead at Christ. And how is my life in Christ? It's the only thing that matters. Is my relationship with him. Not what others are doing. Am I running that kind of race with him? Am I living in his maturity, <coughs> in his grace, each step of the way? Christ promises that he will help us. He will be our strength and our wisdom if we but follow him. Nothing else matters. Doesn't matter how big of a church I serve. Doesn't matter the positions in the district. Those things will never matter. I'll come and go, and somebody else will replace me. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they were saying, Oh, you know, I remember going back to Church of Nazareth, and it was back. Try to remember who the pastor was. And I'm like, I don't remember. You know, that person's gone. Doesn't matter who that was. The question is, who am I right now? Where's my life? Not what I used to do. But what am I doing right now? How am I living this moment? Maturity is not something that is accomplished and then continued forever. You can become <coughs> mature, even in old age. It is a constant pursuit of living a life in Christ. That's what God has called us to. Press onward and upward to the high call of Christ Jesus. Hold on to what Christ has done for you and what Christ is doing right now and what Christ promises he will do mm -hmm. as we live in him. Mm -hmm. If you'll take your hymnal and turn to number 14, The Nicene Creed is an affirmation of our faith. It says, this is what I believe. This is what we believe. This is what will mark my life. So I invite you to stand with me, and I hope that you can unify with us in saying, this is 
who I am in Christ Jesus as we recite these words. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. If you'll join with us together as we sing, Find Us Faithful. May the words of that creed, may the words that Paul is speaking about in Philippians 3, find us faithful each and every step. So we sing these words and, and we enter into a time of prayer and prepare our hearts, our minds for communion. Join us in lifting up and focusing. Lord, enable me to be faithful to you. something that we have done or something that we have failed to do. Lord, guide and direct us that our lives would be following you at all times and in all ways. That we would be witnesses of your grace. That others would see our life and know what it is to love you, to follow you, to know you intimately. 
Lord, we thank you for your promise. Lord, there are any needs that we come before you with. There are those of our family, our friends who need your healing touch. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us, guide us, to reach out to those around us. To be healing instruments of your grace. Lord, as we think about the children, the youth of our community, there are so many who do not know you as Lord and Savior. Some who know about you. Some who know incorrectly about you. Lord, help us that as we reach out and seek to demonstrate your love and grace through our lives, that they would see the truth. That they would come into a mature understanding of what you want to do in and through their lives. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear the prayer of your people. Lord, guide our hearts and minds Mom. as we draw us around your table Mom. that your grace would speak to us of your mercy, of your presence, Mom. and the hope that we have in and through you. All this we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Those who are watching will see this later on YouTube. We thank you for joining and being with us at this time. May God's blessing and grace be with you.